Hi. Like to get started again? So, hi, my name is Brennan, and I'm going to be talking to you today about training performance. Now, this talk is centered around a user's guide to how to improve performance. So, there's, performance is very complicated. There's a lot of internals to TensorFlow as to things we're doing to optimize your training time. But what I'm going to talk to you today is about how you can make the most of the TensorFlow you know and love to converge faster. Now, before I go any further, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the great work that is done not just by other engineers on the TensorFlow team and not just by other teams at Google, but actually also by our partner teams, for example, the performance team at NVIDIA. They've done a lot of work to help make TensorFlow work fast, and I want to make sure we acknowledge that. With that, let's dig into a little bit of motivation. Why do we need performance? Why do we need to improve performance? Isn't it just fine today? Some folks at Baidu put together some research, and they showed that if you want to improve the quality of your models, just train on larger data sets. These beautiful straight lines are showing that for a multiple different models, as you just give more and more training data, you just get linearly more accurate. Now, I'm actually being slightly facetious here. If you look closely, the axes on this graph are actually logarithmic. They are not linear. And so really, we don't need linearly increasing the amounts of data. We need exponentially more data to keep improving our models. And they found that this trend holds not just for different model classes on, uh, in this case, it was um, uh, a sequence to sequence type, type work, but they found this applied to images. They found this applied to translation to multiple different areas across multiple different model types. So we're going to need to train on exponentially more data to improve our model quality. Unfortunately, we're running into quite the obstinate adversary, physics. Here's a graph of microprocessor trend data over 40 years, and we can see that clock frequency has entirely hit a, hit a wall. Single-threaded performance is not getting that much faster compared to how it used to. We're going to have to work a lot harder to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow with performance. Silicon itself is not going to get us there without a little bit of cleverness. The result of these two forces coming together has resulted in a Cambrian explosion of accelerator hardware. Not just CPUs, but we have GPUs today and TPUs, and there's other more exciting things coming. There's startups like uh, Nirvana that is now part of Intel, and there's the IPU from GraphCore that are taking a bunch of different points in the design space and are trying different hardware methodologies and layouts to try and get the best machine learning performance. So this is going to be a very exciting exciting area coming forward uh, as we think about performance in the future. Now, before I dig into the meat of my talk, I do want to give a, uh, a, I do want to acknowledge this is actually the Jurassic period and not of the pre-Cambrian era. So if you have a good picture of trilobites that is Creative Commonsly licensed, please do send it my way. In a nutshell, the machine learning training loop across a wide variety of different uh, models and paradigms looks roughly as follows. You have your training data, and you need to load that in. This is sort of phase one. You read it from either disk or generate it from a reinforcement learning environment. You decompress it, you parse it. If you're doing, for example, an image model, you perform image augmentations, random flips, color distortions, and whatnot. And you batch it up to feed it into your model. And phase two, you compute the forward pass of your model, you compute the loss, the backwards pass, your gradients, and finally, after you have the gradients, you update the weights, the things you're trying to learn, and you repeat the cycle all over again. Now, again, there's a wide variety of accelerators, but to a first approximation, we see the following patterns emerge. Your training data and your pre-processing, your phase one, happens mostly on CPUs. The accelerator then takes over phase two and phase three. And with that, let's dig in. In my experience, as people migrate to modern accelerators, new TPUs, new generation of GPUs, et cetera. Phase one is actually where the most performance problems are. Things everyone hits. There's always a problem with phase one. So we're going to spend a bit of time digging into to input pipelines. Now, you heard earlier from Derek about tf.data. This is definitely the far and away recommended uh, API and way to load data into TensorFlow. And here's, if you're doing a simple image model, for example, ResNet 50, your input pipeline will probably start off looking like this. You have your data, your images batched together into TF record files, and you load them in with the TF record data set. 
You can shuffle and repeat your parser function that you map across every input image. That will do things like parse TF examples, JPEG decode, your color transformations, augmentations. You batch it up and you return your data set. Now, if you run this on a fancy pants cloud TPU, a modern accelerator, you're actually only going to get about 150 images a second. This is nowhere near what you should expect. Now, before you think, wow, cloud TPUs must be total garbage, I'm going to go back to what I was doing before, it behooves you to try and optimize performance. Now, when you're optimizing performance, it's incredibly important to follow the, a methodology. You have to measure your performance, find your bottleneck, optimize your bottleneck, and repeat. So what does that look like with a cloud TPU? Again, there's tools in TensorFlow for GPUs and TPUs. But for cloud TPUs, we have this tool uh, called Capture TPU Profile. And you can run this to, um, excuse me, you can run this uh, pointing it to your TPU. In this case, the TPU name is SATA. Um, and you will uh, also have it capture the profile into a log directory. This is the same log directory you use with TensorBoard, and so you can load it up into TensorBoard. And with that, I'd like to switch to my laptop, where you, we can actually see what the profiling tools look like. So here is a, a trace from actually the, the very same input pipeline, or very similar to the input pipeline I just showed. And you can see here that your step time graph, you have this tiny bit of orange at the bottom. And this is the compute time on the cloud TPU. And everything up here, this blue, that's actually waiting for data. That's input pipeline processing. So our TPU is actually sitting idle, and this is telling you 92% of the time. Totally, totally not what we want to be doing. So let's dig in. Now, what I recommend using, we have a bunch of tools, and they're constantly improving and getting better. But for now, to really understand what's going on underneath the hood, we're going to use the trace viewer. So here I've loaded it up. One thing I should note is that the trace viewer it's very much designed for power users, so it may be a little unapproachable. Let me walk you through a little bit about where to look in the trace viewer. So in the top, you actually have your TPU. Now, one cloud TPU has eight compute cores, uh, and these operate independently, although typically they're operating on the same sorts of data just uh, in parallel. So these are at the top. You can see your step number. You can see the TensorFlow ops that it's executing. And finally, the XLA ops. So TPUs are programmed via XLA, and you can see what's going on underneath the hood. Below that, you see your CPU compute threads. Now, this TF compute, these are your general TensorFlow thread pool threads. You've got your iterator thread. And then finally, there's a set of threads for in-feed and out-feed. These are the threads that are managing DMAs to and from the, the TPU device. Now, it's a little hard to see at the top. Uh, so we're going to need to zoom in. We're going to need to look in in a little bit more depth. So in order to navigate around within the trace, the keyboard shortcuts I find are the most useful. Now, it's, the keyboard shortcuts are from the left hand. So A and D move left and right. W and S move in and out. So this is a little bit like the arrow uh, on like a keypad, just with your left hand on the home row. Now, there's a couple other keyboard shortcuts. So for example, if you click on something, you can see the details about what this is. And if you press F, you'll focus in on just that sort of element of the timeline. So you can zoom in and navigate around really easily. And if you want to see what, a little bit more about it, you can press M. And this marks it on the UI. And so you can see that our step time, our training step 80, took 5.4 seconds. And if we go to the in-feed queue, that was actually also 5.4 seconds. So let's dig into what's going on on the CPU since the TPU is just sitting idle waiting for data. Now, there's a lot of things going on, so we're going to need to zoom in a lot farther. So let's zoom in, not just at the second range, but let's zoom in down to the millisecond range. So here, we can see each of these vertical bars. That's five milliseconds, OK? And if we zoom in this far, we can see that our iterator is running continuously, and the map function is what's taking the longest amount of time, OK? The map function, there's a bunch of other little ops that are happening here uh, that are your batching or your repeating or, or whatnot. But the map function is the bulk of the time. So that's where we need to focus our optimization efforts. And the map function runs the elements of the map uh, on, on your normal standard TensorFlow thread pool. And if you look actually closely, we can zoom in a bit further, there's actually no two ops running at the same time. Even though we're using multiple different threads in the thread pool, we're actually processing this single threaded. And that leads us to our first optimization. So we're going to switch back to the slides. 
This is what you need to do to use multiple threads for your input pipeline for your map function. You just set num parallel calls to 64, and you'll be using up to 64 threads uh, on your compute node. And because cloud TPUs are hooked up to a very powerful host machine, you can certainly use all of these threads uh, running concurrently. And if you do this and rerun your, your tool, uh, rerun your model, you have a 4x improvement, over 600 images a second. So that's pretty great. But we're not done. An important part of the performance methodology is step three, repeat. You have to repeat again. So we take a new trace. I'm not going to do it live on the laptop, because uh, we want to go through. We have a lot of st stuff to cover. We now see right here, we have a lot more compute threads going on, but we're still very much input bound. And if we zoom in a lot, you can actually see that the bottom element here, this TF record, we're waiting for data to load from our file system. We then process things in parallel really quickly, and then we take a while to transfer them to the device over PCIe. And so this presents a pipelining opportunity. Now, to give you a bit of intuition for what I mean, input pipelines you should always mentally associate with ETL. ET extract is the first phase where you load the data from storage. Transform phase is where you prepare it for training. And finally, you load it into the accelerator. And this is reflected not just in the API, but this is a very useful mental model when you think about performance. Now, to give you a bit of intuition for that, the each, each of the different phases of ETL use different hardware components in your server system. Your extract phase is exercising your disk and your storage system or your network link if you're loading from a remote, remote storage system. Transform typically happens on the CPU and is very CPU hungry. And your load phase is exercising the DMA, the connections, to your accelerator. And this is true whether you're using a GPU or a TPU or potentially any other accelerators that you might be using. And so what's going on is if you map this out over time, you're extracting. And while you're extracting, you're doing nothing with the CPU. And during the transform phase, you're doing nothing with the connection between the CPU memory and your accelerator. And while you're training, the entire CPU and the whole rest of the machine is just sitting idle. This is incredibly wasteful. Because they're all using different components in your system, you can actually overlap all of this in a technique called software pipelining. So with software pipelining, you actually are extracting for step five while you're transforming for step four, you're loading data for step three, and you're training for step two. And this results in a very efficient use of your, your compute resources. You get to train a whole lot faster. Now, you'll notice that in a well-pipelined uh, model, your accelerator will be 100% utilized, but it's possible that your CPU or maybe even your disk will be a little bit idle. And that's OK. Your accelerator is typically your most precious resource, and so that's what you want to be the bottleneck. It's OK if some of the other resources are, are slightly faster than you need them to be. So how do you enable software pipelining with data sets? It's actually very easy. You set num parallel reads is equal to 32, and underneath the hood, tf.data is automatically using Parallel interleave, which is a key data set transformation that enables software pipelining. The other important change to make to your input pipeline is you set prefetch is equal to 2 right at the end. And this ensures that everything above is pipelined with everything below, in particular your data transformations and your extraction is pipelined from your loading into your accelerator. Now, one thing I want to mention, when you set num parallel reads is equal to 32, you're also using, well, parallel reads. And this actually, the reason why we've sort of conflated these two in the API is because we believe that distributed storage is going to be critical going forward for machine learning workloads. And so why is that? We've, as we have the research, we see that data sets are going to become larger and larger over time. And so you're really going to need, they just won't fit on a single machine. You're going to need to distribute them across a cluster. Additionally, when you have data disaggregated from your, from your accelerator nodes, it means you can more efficiently share your accelerator nodes so that if you're training on, on, on them today and tomorrow or maybe in three minutes someone else wants to train on it, you're not copying data sets around. It's just easier to use. And finally, it makes it a lot nicer when you're doing large-scale hyperparameter searches if you have one high-performance cluster and a fungible pool of accelerator resources. So we believe that distributed storage is going to be very important. We've worked very hard to make that fast with tf.data. So what happens if you do this? Well, as it turns out, with a cloud TPU, you'll get over 1,700 images a second with these optimizations. So we're now about 12 times faster than our initial input pipeline with actually less than 60 characters worth of typing. So that's pretty good. 
but we can do better. If you capture the trace, you'll actually see that our transform step is slightly longer than our accelerator trading model time. The TPU is just too fast. And we need to break out some advanced optimization techniques that are available today. One of the most powerful ones is to use these fused data set operators, map and batch, shuffle and repeat, that fuse together these operations to improve your performance on your CPU. TF.data works very, very hard to ensure that the elements produced out of your data set by your iterator are in a deterministic order. But if you give tf.data permission to reorder, we can enable a number of additional performance optimizations. And so we can use sloppy interleave underneath the hood, which can work around a lot of variability in certain storage systems. There's other small tweaks that you can do, but if you apply all of them together, and for example, this optimized input pipeline, we get well over 2,000 images a second, and we are now accelerator bound. To see what that looks like, Here's TensorBoard, and you can see that everything is 100% orange. We've entirely optimized away our input pipeline. We're entirely accelerator bound, and the accelerator is just churning 100% of the time. This is really great. This means that we now can actually start looking into optimizations that we can do on the TPU to make the TPU faster, because we can see that our CPU is idle. And so we can see that there's some overhead, this reshape and copy that we might think about optimizing away with some device-specific optimizations, which brings me to phase two. Now, as I mentioned before, we're in this sort of Cambrian explosion. And while we're still in the early days, we're finding that a lot of these different accelerators behave very differently. Some chips are smaller. Some chips are bigger. Some chips use uh, HBM2, so for example, TPUs and GPUs, whereas some chips do away with that entirely, such as GraphCore's IPU, and go entirely for SRAM and optimize for communication. And so it's a little hard to provide out-of-the-box performance recommendations that are going to apply to all of these different hardware platforms. That said, there are a few common things that if we peer into the future, if we gaze into our crystal balls, we think this is what we're going to see more of. One thing that I expect we're going to see a lot of is interesting numerical formats. Now, this is FP32. It's a four-byte, 32-bit floating-point format that we know and love, IEEE. Most models today have been trained in FP32. There was some really great work put in by the folks at NVIDIA and Baidu, and they showed that with a little bit of clever tricks, you can train in FP16. Your weights stay in FP32, but your activations are in FP16. And this turns out to be a big win on two dimensions. Number one, you can run a larger model because more, more layers fits in memory. But additionally, your model tends to run faster because accelerators today, GPUs and actually even TPUs, are not compute bound, they're actually memory bandwidth bound. The high bandwidth memory that we use on the accelerators is still too slow. And so FP16 can unlock a lot of great performance on devices. But I want to mention one other floating point format that's available, and that's BFloat16. TPUs are designed, uh, have hardware support for BFloat16, and this actually is different than FP16. Even though it uses just 16 bits, the range is the same as FP32, and so you don't worry as much about vanishing gradients or exploding gradients in NANDs that you might encounter if you use FP16. There are a number of additional floating point formats or numerical formats, such as FlexPoint. Uh, some folks from Intel presented at NIPS in a poster session, and I encourage you to check that out. Uh, but across all of this, we in TensorFlow, we're going to work hard to make it easier to use all these different numerical floating point formats. So stay tuned for more APIs and development in this space. One other hardware trend that I think we're going to see is we're going to see hardware optimization for matrix multiplication, especially in this mixed precision mode. So NVIDIA Volta GPUs, they have these tensor cores, which are hardware optimized 4 by 4 matrix multiplies. TPUs are built around a 128 by 128 matrix unit. And this is a systolic array, this special hardware transistor configuration that makes it really efficient to compute multiplication and actually, as it turns out, convolutions. Here's this little graphic uh, illustrating what a systolic array sort of does. And it sort of um, flows through in this, uh, it's named after the heart, which is pumping blood in these cycles. Uh, and it plums through the, the data, and, and, and you get really fast matrix multiplication. What this means is because we're seeing hardware-supported matrix multiplication at different sizes and scales, the way you lay out your data and the way your model is implemented can make a huge difference on performance on these accelerators. Here I'm calling out 
two different um, uh, models running on GPUs, where if you use channels last on a GPU, you end up losing a fair bit of performance compared to a channel's first implementation. If you compare different LSTM cells impl cell implementations, the folks at NVIDIA have worked really hard to make really fast kernels for LSTMs, and they make it available as part of the CUDNN package. So if you're using a GPU and you want to get better performance, make sure you use the optimized libraries for your platform. Now, this is true. You need to use the latest version of TensorFlow. We're constantly working on performance improvements. The latest version of CUDNN and Intel MKL, which we talked about earlier today. If you still, aren't, if you still want better performance, investigate 16-bit numerical, numerical representations. We see a lot of potential performance advantages there. And if you're doing inference, we've talked previously about TensorRT, which is available for NVIDIA platforms that can help quantize and make inference really fast. And the, as a really advanced technique, if you see that, for example, a particular computation is a bottleneck, you can try and substitute it with something that's computationally faster. That said, you have to be very careful because you may change the quality of your model as part of doing this. With that, I'd like to move on to phase three. Now, typically, when you use an accelerator, you're actually using more than one accelerator. Even if you're using a single device, it may have different components within it that operate in parallel. Here is, for example, a picture of the NVIDIA DGX1 and shows the connectivity between the eight GPUs. You have two cliques of four GPUs each with connectivity between them. And as it turns out, if you don't take advantage of this topology, if you do, for example, a naive gradient aggregation within the single server, for example, by going to the CPU or going via the PCIe switches, you will have a significant performance disadvantage compared to a clever utilization of NVLink um, via Nickel, NCCL2. Now, we have an optimized implementation available as part of the TFCNN benchmarks, but it's a little tricky to use, and so we're going to be working on making this uh, easy for everyone to use in distribution strategies. And you'll hear a little bit more about distribution strategies in just a few minutes. TPUs, you also need to carefully aggregate your gradients. And we have the cross shard optimizer. So what you'll do is you take your existing optimizer, momentum, stochastic gradient descent, SGD, and just wrap it with the TPU cross shard optimizer. And this will take care of aggregating across all the different compute shards within a single device but the exact same code works all the way up to a whole cloud TPU pod across 64 different devices. Now, I want to take one moment to actually talk a little bit about measuring performance. I guess the saying goes, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, I'm going to add a fourth one, performance benchmarks. The internet is replete with shoddy benchmarks and misinformation, and this irks me to no end. We've seen benchmarks that have, they use synthetic data, or they're measuring only certain subsets, and so you have uh, in, incomplete comparisons. One benchmark is comparing the full device, one is comparing only one part of the device. We've seen bugs in the machine learning where they've optimized away or done performance tricks that make it run faster, but actually make it not converge to the same accuracy. You've lost quality of your model. And additionally, as we look forward, this is actually, to be fair, a very nuanced space. And hardware is becoming harder and harder to give an apples and to apples comparison because we have different numerical formats and different algorithms fit better on different classes of hardware. Some chips, for example, the IPU, have very small amounts of memory. And so if you have a very, very big model that just can't fit, that's a very unfair comparison. And so as a result, I strongly encourage you, if you're trying to choose and evaluate different hardware platforms, Take your workloads and measure them end-to-end -to, -end to the accuracy that you want in your application. That said, that's a fair amount of work. So if you can't run your own workloads, look to quality end-to-end -end benchmarks that measure time to accuracy. And I think the best example of this today is Stanford's Dawn Bench. Now, while there's nuance in the parameters of how the benchmarking are set. For example, the data set size. Are you training on a small data set size that fits in RAM or a large data set size that you've got to load in over the network? And there's nuance in how you set the accuracy threshold. 
it's a lot harder, despite these, it's a lot harder for a system to perform well on an end-to-end -end benchmark, but then not be useful for real work. You're less likely to be misled when you look at these end-to-end -end benchmarks. That said, while we're pushing very hard for these end-to-end -end benchmarks, there's actually a lot of utility in what we call micro-benchmarks to try and understand how fast are these different components. When I was preparing these slides and optimizing ResNet 50 for the cloud TPU case, how did I know that 150 images a second was way too slow? We can look to micro-benchmarks to give ourselves calibration. So as Derek mentioned before, input pipelines on a DGX1 can have over 13,000 images a second, and that's using VGG preprocessing. This preprocessing is a little bit more computationally cheaper than the ResNet or Inception preprocessing, but it shows that we can go really, really fast. ResNet 50 um, on a DGX1 with real data is about 5.8 thousand images a second. And this is using a mixed precision IEEE Float 16. This is based on TFCNN benchmarks available with TensorFlow nightly. So this is the performance you can expect coming forward in the future. Now, if you just want to test the performance of the GPUs themselves in isolation, that's about 6.1 synthetic images a second. So, you've so you basically are excluding the cost of your input pipeline. For a cloud TPU, we have a few other micro benchmarks. For TensorFlow 1.7 that's available today, you can expect to achieve 2.65 thousand images a second on a cloud TPU, and that's using mixed precision BFloat 16 and FP32. You're streaming your data in from GCS with a batch size of 1024, and you can get to 76%, over 76% accuracy in about 13 hours. If you lop off the input pipeline and just test the device performance, you're actually over 3,200 images a second, which is very cool with TensorFlow 1.7. And with TensorFlow Nightly, so this will be coming in TensorFlow 1.8, we've done a huge amount of work to optimize the input pipeline performance, and you go from two and, uh, 2,600 images a second to over 3,000 images a second on a single cloud TPU, and this is coming in TensorFlow 1.8. So very exciting, uh, a lot of work happening underneath, underneath the hood. As we stare into the future even further, what is coming in TensorFlow with, perform with performance? Now, this is actually our optimized input pipeline, uh, or something very close to it. And you'll notice that there's sort of a lot of magic numbers in there that we've just hand-tuned and, and picked out. Well, how do we choose them? Well, we spend a lot of time playing around with it and picking them out. Do you need to do that? There's absolutely no reason why you need to do that. We can actually auto-tune a lot of these values, and we're going to be working on adding in smarts into TensorFlow to just tune your pipelines for you. And this is true not just of these magic numbers, but actually of data set transformations. These fused, these fused data set transformation op operations will be working on automatically switching a naive, a straightforward implementation to use the fused operations underneath the hood. And if you give us permission, we'll be able to adjust things where we're not preserving necessarily the order, but we're able to do the right things for you. Now, one thing I'd like to mention is that uh, automatically tuning the prefetch buffer size, so that, that last line, that's available and coming in TensorFlow 1.8. We're not just working on optimizing the input pipelines. We're working on optimizing on-device performance. And there's two frameworks within TensorFlow. There's XLA and there's Grappler that are automatically doing graph transformations, picking optimal image layouts, for example, or rewriting your model to work well on different hardware platforms. And so there's a lot of exciting work going on here that we'll be excited to share with you over time. There's a lot more reading, and there's a huge amount of literature on this, so I encourage you to check out some of these things. Uh, if you would like to learn a little bit more about reduced precision training, here are some useful references. And actually, the traces that I had screenshots of in this talk I'll tweet out this link shortly, um, but they'll be available so you can download and load them up into TensorBoard and play around with them yourself. With that, thank you very much for listening to me today.